wrote an award-winning series of articles for the Winston-Salem Journal that, and along with the work of Hunt's attorney, led to DNA evidence that exonerated Hunt. But that's not the end of the story, as, as Phoebe tells it in her new book, Beyond Innocence. It's, it is the story of his life. You learn about Daryl Hunt. Phoebe is an investigative journalist, narrative writer, and college professor. Her work has been highlighted by organizations such as the Neiman Foundation for Journalism at Harvard, the Investigative Reporters and Editors Society, the Society of Professional Journalists, the Columbia Journalism Review, the North Carolina Press Association, and featured in the HBO documentary, The Trials of Daryl Hunt. She is the Director of Journalism Program at Wake Forest University. Joining Phoebe tonight is Tim Tyson. He is the Senior Research Scholar at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University and an Adjunct Professor of American Studies at the University of North Carolina. He serves on the board of uh, the NAACP in North Carolina and the UNC Executive Board for Civil Rights. His most recent book, The Blood of Emmett Till, won the 200 in our 2018 Robert F. Kennedy Book Award. If you have questions, we're going to take your questions a little bit later. There's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Just type your questions in there. And at this point, Tim, I'll leave this to you and, and uh, Phoebe, and I'm going to sit back and listen. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phoebe, it's so good to be with you this evening. And I just wanted to say that, you know, Beyond Innocence, uh, the life sentence of Daryl Hunt is one of the most compelling stories I've read in a long time. It's beautifully oh. crafted. It's, it, it cuts deep. Once in a while, a story, a single human story will just crack open the world that you think that you knew and make you rethink uh, your assumptions about things. Mm. And I felt that reading this book, even though I've studied these matters for a long time. I, I, uh, I wanted to ask you, when did you come to believe for an absolute certainty that Daryl Hunt was not guilty of either of the murders with which he was charged? Oh, that's a really good question because when I was first looking into his, his case back in 2003, when I was a reporter at the Winston-Salem Journal, you know, I had my um, reporter hat on. And uh, what I was really interested in mm -hmm. was um, trying to understand the case and trying to understand what the evidence was and really looking at the facts. And my impulse was to believe him. Um, I met him in prison in, in 2003. And I certainly liked him and wanted to believe him, but I didn't want to be guided by my feelings in this. Um, I wanted the, the stories I wrote to be guided by, by the facts. And so I, I, I don't know that I can answer when I first really believed that he was innocent because I was so determined um, to be more clinical about it. But, you know, I would say, you know, pretty, pretty early on in the reporting process um, of, of that early work. Um, I, I certainly, by the end, was completely convinced, convinced that the case against him didn't add up um, as far as his innocence. You know, I would say probably about halfway into the reporting was when I really came to think that. But I don't know that there was an exact turning point that I can think of. There you go. How did you, uh, who was Daryl Hunt? Yeah, so that is, that's a really good question. So Daryl Hunt was a 19 year old black man, teenager, you know, really young person living in Winston-Salem. He, back in 1984, when his life, uh, you know, took this turn, he was just, uh, he'd, he'd been orphaned, he was, kind of semi-homeless because he was unemployed and, and really looking for work, but he'd been raised by his grandfather who he really, really admired. His grandfather had worked for the city streets department 
And what Daryl Hunt really wanted was to get it, get on with the city streets department and get married and have children. And he liked animals and he wanted, you know, some land where the, to put her around on. And I think that's who he really was. And he didn't get the chance to to have that life when when he was first arrested and interviewed by his attorney Mark Rabel. Um, he talked about what what he really wanted was just to lead what he called a decent life. Um, but but all of that was taken away from him when uh, when he was arrested and charged with this uh, horrific crime, the rape and murder of a young white woman. And and when that happened, you know, he was a poor black kid in in Winston Salem, and to be charged with that crime, um, his once he was arrested, I think his conviction was all but inevitable, and this thing that he really wanted was was taken away from him. I think maybe most uh, white people walking down the street mm -hmm. uh, have a hard time believing that. Uh, someone who's charged with a murder, let alone two, yes. uh, just absolutely had nothing whatsoever to do with that. And uh, it seemed too that even after the DNA that some of, uh, there were some people in Winston-Salem who had a hard time giving up their sense that the safe case had been solved and that he was in fact guilty. How do you how do you explain that, or do you, can you? Uh, so, you know, we're we're all raised to believe that in our court system, and that you're innocent until proven guilty, right? And that that there are checks and balances, and that um, and that we've built a system that everybody's entitled to a lawyer, and there are opportunities for appeal, and there's cross examination. And I think certainly when I first started working on this almost 20 years ago, um, in general, white people I encountered in Winston-Salem thought that he must be guilty because by 2003, he'd um, had two trials. He'd been represented by some of the best attorneys in North Carolina. He had this defense committee that kept his case alive. It had been investigated twice by two different sets of police officers. It'd gone all the way through um, the North Carolina appellate courts and all the way through the uh, federal appellate court system. And people, and there were a lot of witnesses who saw him at the scene. And so people tended to think that, you know, how could, how could the system have, have missed a truly innocent man? And black people I met in Winston-Salem had a very different view. I mean, when I first started working on this and would go around black neighborhoods looking for witnesses and people who'd been involved in the case and just randomly run into people, um, people would say to me, it's a good thing you're taking a fresh look at this. That guy was railroaded. And I think white people and black people in this country have a completely different experience of what the what our criminal legal system is all about. And the kind of bias or systemic racism that Hunt faced um, is is very well understood to, to Black people. The, one of my favorite lines in the book and from that original series that I wrote was, um, was from this woman named Estella McFadden who lived near where Hunt was staying and she was one of the first two or three members of his defense committee. There was a city councilman in town named Larry Little, who um, was already in 84, a civil rights activist. And he, he believed that Hunt was innocent because he knew him. And so he started recruiting people to this committee that he was forming. And one of the first people was this woman named Estella McFadden. And what she told me when I first interviewed her was, well, you know, um, we're black people and we know that when bad things happen, they'll go and snatch just about anybody they can find. So the idea that, um, that this young black man could be innocent um, was something that, that was, was well understood by black people in Winston-Salem, but not by white people. In 1990, 
uh, Hunt turned down an offer uh, to plead guilty yeah. to this murder and actually another one, yes. which, of which he was also wrongly convicted and walk out the front door of that prison a free man on time already served. Mm -hmm. what, what, is, what does that say to you about who he might be? And uh, Yeah, so that kind of gets back to the first question, who was he and what does it mean to be a, a decent, he wanted a decent life, I think he was a decent person. Um, I mean, more than that, but I mean, that word feels important to me um, because it was a word he used, but um, what had happened um, by 1990, so he was convicted in this horrific uh, rape and murder in 1985, and then appealed that conviction and um, won that appeal. So he was, he was given a new trial, but also during this period, um, he was also wrongly accused of another earlier murder that had nothing to do with this uh, rape and murder of the copy editor. It was a case that I later learned may in all likelihood wasn't even a homicide. It could have been an accidental death, but a mm -hmm. older uh, black man in Winston-Salem was found dead on the street outside an illegal liquor house. And it was an unsolved crime dating back to 1983. And the police department in the in around 86 decided to, to try to solve some of these unsolved cases. And people um, claimed that they'd seen Daryl Hunt there. And so Daryl Hunt was charged with that crime. And he was convicted in 87 and then appealed that and won a second trial. So he was out on appeal, awaiting two new trials in 1990. Um, by then he's, 25 years old, still a very young person. And um, they moved, and the context is important, they moved both trials from Winston-Salem to Catawba County where Hickory, North Carolina is. It's a rural, um, a rural community um, in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains, a furniture producing community. Um, very few black people living there. He, he was from a city uh, that was about 30% black. And so they moved both trials there and he was, they were in the middle of the second trial in this liquor house killing. And he was offered, and, and the Deborah Sykes case wouldn't start for several more months. And the prosecutors offered him a plea deal. So many, many um, felonies are settled by plea agreements, right? Yeah. But they offered him a plea deal that if he pled guilty to both of these murders, uh, he could go free for time served, meaning the six years he'd already been in prison would be sufficient punishment for these two crimes. So you asked, what does it say about Daryl Hunt? And I'll get to that in a second, but. I also want to think about what it says about the prosecution that they would, um, for the kind of murder, especially the rape and murder of this woman in downtown Winston-Salem, to offer somebody time served that they could be free for after six years is unheard of. And it tells me that Either they knew that their case against Hunt was weak, either they were really worried about it, um, or they knew somewhere that, that he was actually innocent. You would not offer somebody whose guilt you were persuaded of the chance to walk free, somebody who'd committed that horrific a crime. Um, two, two. Two. I mean, um, a double and, murderer. Double murder. A man with a pattern of murder. You're going to put him on the street after six years. That's right. just nonsense. It was nonsense. And so at that time, Daryl Hunt had, you know, lawyers, he had advisors. Um, there were several ministers who were really active in his defense. And Larry Little was still really active in, in his defense. And everybody with the exception of a minister named John Mendez, Reverend John Mendez, wanted him to take this plea because they knew how horrific life in prison was. 
and they thought that this would give him a chance to start over again and he would be safe. I mean, they didn't want him, they felt very, they loved him. They didn't want him to go back to prison, but um, Daryl Hunt would not do it. He, he said that he could not, he could not lie. He could not say he had done something that he hadn't done and he turned it down um, knowing that in all likelihood that would mean that he would go back to prison. Um, so it tells me that he had a lot of integrity and um, yeah, that he had a lot of integrity. What Now what happened was, I mean, you, you could say, well, maybe he thought the case against him was weak, but he knew that wasn't the case. Now he ended up being acquitted of the, the death of um, the, the black man outside the liquor house. And that, that case was weak, but when that happened, it didn't make Daryl Hunt think, oh, I've got a good chance in the Deborah Sykes case. What he understood was that a white jury in Catawba County really didn't care all that much about the, the black victim. And he knew that it would be almost impossible for him to win um, in the second case in the Sykes murder. And several months later, he was in fact convicted again. So this is a long way of saying when he turned down that plea offer, I don't think he had much expectation um, that he was going to be acquitted in, in both of those murders. Yeah, I, I, I knew Daryl Hunt in the years after mm -hmm. these cases were resolved. He was after he was exonerated and he was a gentle man. Yes. A profoundly gentle person. And then for him to be unwilling to take that plea deal when really he couldn't expect anything better than to spend the rest of his life in prison. That the Sykes murder was so brutal and a, a white victim at that and, and somebody who nobody outside of that black community there cared about and saw as a human being really, mm -hmm. you couldn't expect, uh, I, I don't think you could expect for him to go free. And for both of those things, for to him to be the way he was and to walk through the world the way he did and, and then to have that kind of integrity. It's funny in all of this, he comes out as this most sterling person. And I'm not Pollyanna, you know, Re Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. I am not. I do not expect people who've been badly treated and had a rough time of things to be angels. But uh, I'm just, I was just struck by his character. And I don't know how do you cut any deeper to that than that. But uh, I want to ask you about the title. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about the title, Beyond Innocence, the life sentence of Daryl Hunt. Can you sort of exegete that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So Beyond Innocence, what um, what that means to me is that um, is it, uh, what I wanted it to evoke is this idea of what happens after somebody is exonerated, that we have this sense there now have been 3,000 proven cases of wrongful conviction. So we've seen a lot of these stories unfold. And, you know, there's this, the court hearing, there's, it's, it, there, there's this triumph, there, there's exultation and happiness. And there's this feeling that, okay, our system is flawed, but it finally worked and justice was done. And we've recognized the innocence and, um, and this person is going to go on to lead um, to lead his life. And so what the book really explores is how how difficult that is, how the wrongful conviction is a soul shattering experience and carries with it a tremendous amount of trauma and that prison carries with it a tremendous amount of trauma. And then coming home after living for 19 years in prison, is a transition that is, is nearly impossible because so much has been taken from you. And in Daryl Hunt's case, he went on to become, in the way you got to know him, is he was a advocate for social justice, right? And he was yes. in a documentary about his case that really gave him a national, even international platform. And so he did all of this work that 
led to, to real change in North Carolina. Um, I think you got to know him when he was working on advocating for the Racial Justice Act. That's right. Which, um, and um, and his story uh, was so powerful because it showed the racial bias that he faced when his case was a capital case and when they were going after the death penalty for him. And the Racial Justice Act is a law in North Carolina that allows uh, people with on death row to appeal not their conviction but their sentence if they can show that there's racial bias in the sentencing. Yeah. And so Daryl Hunt traveled all over the state and told his story. And in his case, that work gave him meaning, but it was also, um, I think it was re-traumatizing for him. And people who yeah. were with him at during that time period, you know, could see that happening. And so he could he was never really free to both heal from the experience and 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 really move on. And he also worked with um, people coming home from prison in Winston-Salem. So he, there was a lot of conflict in the kind of advocacy work that he did. You know, the people who, who worked with him to get him exonerated really wanted him to work on policy, big policy issues like the Racial Justice Act. And, and um, he also advocated for reform in criminal proceedings so that to prevent wrongful conviction. But what he really wanted to work on uh, was more straightforward kind of work. He really wanted to work on helping people coming home from prison, just like the people he'd been in prison with, um, try to find their way back in the free world. And so he did one-on-one -on -one work, mentoring people, helping them get jobs, sitting really kind of almost acting as a counselor and, um, but that also was really um, painful for him because he knew what they were up against because he understood um, how our system of uh, justice works. And um, so that's the first part of the title. I'm going on a little bit long here, but the second part of, of the title really comes from, from an interview actually that Daryl Hunt gave about the work he did with reentry with people coming home from prison. And he talked about the hurdles that they faced and how, and the systemic barriers in place that made it so hard for people to start their life over again. And he talked about how any kind of sentence, whether it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, a life sentence like he had that because you carry that record with you once you're released from prison, that, um, that any kind of criminal record um, acts as a life sentence. And there's, there's a lot of truth in, in, that, in yeah. that observation. And so that's, that's what the title is, is meant to get at. That he, his experience really served as a life sentence for him and the experience of the two million people we have in prison right now and the millions more who have a criminal record that 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 that, that is a burden that people carry with them for the rest of their lives phoebe uh i've i'm just i was struck when i read this book mm -hmm. at the craft of it and also at the enormous amount of work that it went into it you know, I sort of know from my own labors what that entails. And, you know, it may not be a book like the Protestant Reformation or the Civil War. Right. But in some ways, a small story like that that's complicated is almost more work. You yeah. really, so I really respect that. And I thank you for this book. I, I wondered, how did you become a writer in the, in the beginnings of things? Oh my gosh, that's a great question. You know, I, I almost became a doctor. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so there was a lot of detouring going on. I teach at Wake Forest now and my, my students, especially the seniors are always in this kind of panic because they don't know what they're gonna do with their life. And, and it took me most of my twenties to find you know, a path that, that made sense to me. Um, 
I don't completely know the answer to that. I, I, I think I became a journalist because I really, it's, it's, it sounds very lame, but I didn't want a desk job. You know, I did that for a while and it was just, it felt so stifling to be, um, I, to be, you know, part of a big bureaucracy and journalism seemed like a way to do something that was going to be meaningful, but that would take me out into the world. And um, it, some days it accomplished that, some days, some days it didn't. Um, and I never really, when I was a newspaper reporter, I, I never really thought of my, I would never have said to anybody, what do you do? Oh, I'm a writer. I was, I said, I'm a newspaper reporter. So um, I think it was, I never thought of it this way, but I think it was to some extent, this story that led me to um, into more long form journalism and has eventually led me to, to writing a book. But I'm really, um, in my head, I'm a reporter first and mm -hmm. it's, the, it's the story and that, dis that, that path of discovery and the, 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 the facts that you uncover and by facts, I don't just mean hard facts, but the details that you uncover reporting that leads to the writing. What do your journalism students make of this? What do you think they've they learned from this book? If if you if they I don't know I don't know that you assigned it to them, but if I were you, no, I don't. I don't talk about it that much. I talk about it more with my writing students because I teach composition and we use the theme of um, of wrongful conviction is kind of the, the subject matter. And I introduced them to Daryl Hunt's story early on in the semester. And it's, it's meant to be kind of a hook into the larger subjects because he was their age when he was arrested. And it's a, it's a pretty compelling story. And um, so that it gives them the, the subject matter, um, I think, it attracts young people, and I it's I hope that it when they start writing their own um, essays and summaries and all the basic kind of first year composition assignments, um, I it gives them something to really latch on a subject matter to really sink their teeth into, so that they're writing about something that feels meaningful to them. Um, but that's actually kind of related to my hope for the book, which is that he is, it's a really compelling story. And he is an interesting character and a charismatic person. And all the people around him were really interesting people whose stories I think um, will be interesting to people. His lawyer, Mark Rabel, is a, a complex and sympathetic character. And, Larry Little um, is a civil rights figure and, and, and who was tortured by this case and, and really by what happened to, to Daryl Hunt. And, um, and Daryl Hunt's wife who became his ex-wife is just a, a beautiful person and their love story was, it, 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 it failed ultimately, but they really loved each other deeply. And, um, I got to know two of his friends um, who really helped me understand both life in prison and some of the pressures he was under after prison and, and the, um, yeah, the pressure of being an activist and of being a celebrity and of high expectations that people had for him. And so I think these two men really um, you know, will, will their stories are interesting to people. And so I hope that the book is an opportunity for people to understand one man's story and through that story, understand the themes that run through the book, which have to do with our country's history with, uh, with racism and systemic racism, and which have to do with the way our criminal justice system makes so many mistakes and so often denies justice to people. 
there's oh there's another character in the book who is compelling was which and it's a woman who was raped six, in downtown Winston-Salem, a white woman, six months after the original crime that led to Daryl Hunt's conviction. And she fought off her attacker and survived this horrific attack and tried to get the police to see the similarities between the attack against her and the attack that Hunt was convicted in. And she was silenced. And so, and this was all, this all happened in 1985. So it was way before the Me Too movement, way before as a country, we started paying attention to uh, the stories of victims of sexual assault. And she was effectively silenced. And she's, she plays an important role in Daryl Hunt's story because ultimately um, the case was solved because there was a match, a DNA match with the man that she had identified 20 years earlier. And then her story led to the revelation of the cover up in Daryl Hunt's case. And we now know that police um, saw some connection and, um, and intentionally silenced her because they didn't want to mess up the case against Daryl Hunt. And so that's another thread that runs through this book. And my hope is that because these are such compelling characters and such a compelling story that readers who might not necessarily be drawn to a book about um, the criminal justice system or um, a racial reckoning or a racial reconciliation uh, might find their way to these subject matters through the story. What do you, what do you think the role of the movement was? I, you know, I know uh, Larry Little, and I knew Reverend Carlton Eversley, and I know John Mendez quite well, um, and Rob Stevens, and I, I, uh, I'm sort of familiar with the world in which they move in the social ad advocacy and. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering what the, how important do you think that work was to his act to his being exonerated in the end? Well, the work was, I'm going to back up. Um, I think the work was critical to, um, to his, to the fact that he wasn't um, sentenced to death because they were able to build support for him and raise money now. They were raising money mostly from poor black people. So they were raising money in little bits and pieces at church and at, you know, at small fundraisers. But at the time, um, if you were a court appointed attorney in a capital case, you didn't get a budget to hire experts or to get a private investigator. And so Mark Rabel was able to use the money that uh, Larry Little raised by through this defense committee to hire um, investigators who turned up in enough information about the witnesses in the case um, that it seeded enough doubt, that, that the defense was able to seed enough doubt so that the jury um, didn't sentence Daryl Hunt to death. Now that's not the way it's supposed to work. It's supposed to work that if you have doubt as a jury, you acquit, and then the sentencing phase is supposed to be considering a whole other set of factors having to do with the, um, the, the severity of the crime and aspects about the, the defendant's character. But what happened in this case, and this happens in a lot of death penalty cases, was that the jury convicted, but then because they still had some doubt, they sentenced him to life. So the movement was absolutely critical to, to Daryl Hunt being spared the death penalty. And then along the way, it kept, um, it kept his case alive. I, I know it gave him tremendous hope and um, uh, it a lot enabled him to, to survive essentially in prison because he knew that people um, cared about him and loved him. And it, um, and yeah, it kept the case. It kept the case alive. I, I don't know 
but I haven't thought about whether how it contributed to his ultimate exoneration. Um, it it was, but it was the efforts of his attorney, Mark Rabel, who there were other attorneys along the way, but Mark Rabel is the one who stayed with him till the end, and the, the defense committee that kept the momentum rolling, um, which led to his exoneration. Phoebe, I wanted to follow up on one of Tim's questions. And when you were interviewed by the, the Neiman Foundation, you talked about the importance of the way the story is told. Yes. Uh, about doing it. it. It's not like going to a court hearing and saying, this happened, this happened, this happened, this is what the, the jury um, heard. Uh, it's important that they get context and flow. Can you explain that? A narrative yes. sense. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So this goes back to the question of writing, right? And um, and and how this story, in a sense, taught, taught me to be somebody who maybe I think of myself as a writer now. So that really had to do with the way we presented um, my work back in 2003, because I, after this months of investigation, I really hadn't come up with anything brand new. But what we did come up with was a different way of telling this story that people in Winston-Salem, and I need to point out that that work was done, that newspaper series was written for a newspaper audience that had been following this case for 19 years. So most people knew all the ups and downs and the this and the that, and, and what all the witnesses had said and what the flaws were. But, but when they were able to read it told as a story so that you could really see how the police investigation played out and how they really um, zeroed in on Daryl Hunt and excluded everything else, that people could see that in a way that they hadn't seen before. Or they could really see laid out in front of them how our appellate system works and how um, what he was one justice away on the North Carolina Supreme Court from getting his conviction for getting a third trial. Um, so that the, the telling of the story, um, I think made all the difference in the way people in Winston-Salem saw it, including um, the judge who'd ordered this new round of DNA testing in 2003 that the state crime lab had chosen to ignore. So there was an order to do testing and the they just said, oh, well, this case is closed. We're not going to, you know, it's, this is not something we're going to do. And the district attorney who was new to the case, but he'd been defending the conviction all along, he read this, the, the work that I'd done. So it changed the way people were able to see facts that they kind of thought they already knew. Yeah. Um, and, and in terms of telling a narrative, I suppose it gets back to what I was saying earlier about what I, my hope for the for this book is that because it's a compelling story, um, I mean, it's all true, but in I was trying to make it read a little bit more like a John Grisham novel, you know, something, something that would keep people reading with character and plot and, you know, cliffhangers, all of those techniques that um, I, I just hope that that people who are maybe new to the subject matter um, will be drawn into understanding um, the forces that Daryl Hunt faced that, of course, so many other people in his situation face. In that same interview, it was pointed out that um, one of the people that were asked him some questions had heard you and Mr. Hunt speak. And she raised the question, why not just let him rest in peace? Oh yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so I really struggled with that. So in between the newspaper series and this book, there was a long form magazine article um, and um, I suppose when he died, that's what drew me back to telling this story. And as I got into it, I realized that I was learning things about him that um, he had tried really hard to keep secret. And it's sort of along the lines of what his 
good friend um, kept telling me every time I went to talk to him about Daryl Hunt, he would say, well, you know, Hunt was no, I mean, I ain't no choir boy and Hunt was no angel. So the, you know, we all have flaws, right? And, and the work I was, there's some things in this book about him that are not particularly flattering. And um, I really wrestled with that, you know, is this a fair thing to do? Is this a, do I, is it my place? Um, and I suppose I, I ultimately decided that there was enough value in telling his story um, that it was a fair thing to do. And I also felt that part of what he, now I don't know whether this is my place, but I felt that part of what he suffered from at the end of his life was being misunderstood that a lot of us kind of put him on a pedestal and had these expectations that he was always going to be this calm soft-spoken gracious man when inside he he was suffering and he was angry and he was hurt and um and and it wasn't what was going on inside of him wasn't all that pretty but I felt that that maybe what the full story could do was to help us all understand what the justice system had done to him to 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 cause this kind of suffering and pain. As, as you would bring him into your class and speak at other times, did you ever get a sense as his life was drawing near an end mm -hmm. that he had such turmoil? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody around him had some sense that he was suffering and, and, um, and I, like other people, you know, either didn't really see it. If, if she, one of the, I went back, of course, and looked at all these interviews and thought about, you know, my encounters with him and talked to people who had thought about their encounters with him. And I think people missed, um, miss the depth of the anguish that he was going through. I mean, I certainly knew that he had some anxiety and some paranoia and I'd heard him talk about that, but I just didn't realize how deep it was. And um, I suppose that's partly the, the, the message of the book is that what we do to people when, when, when we deny them justice, when we wrongly convict them, we cause um, unmeasurable harm. We, but, we see them coming out of prison and we see the excitement of being free and we assume a happy ending. Yes. And I think some people, I mean, it looked like Hunt had rebuilt his life. So yes, people can rebuild their lives, but but I, but to really heal, and so many people don't rebuild their lives, and so many people who, who have been exonerated struggle in terrible ways afterwards, and um, and it's because that that kind of injustice. It's not just that they've lost in Hunt's case nineteen years of his life, but the rest of his life was shaped by that trauma that he suffered. Uh, and you sort of sometimes like, you sit back and think, oh, what if that were me that had been put in that position? How would I have been able to deal with that? Yeah, well, I, and, I don't know how to imagine that for myself. Um, 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 I mean, I don't know that I, I couldn't have survived the first night that he spent yeah. in jail with the guards threatening to to hang him. So I, I I can't, I can't imagine myself in, yeah. in you that. You wouldn't wish it on anyone. And it's even after spending, you know, four or five years now writing about his experience, I still can't really put myself in that, in that place. I, I don't know. I don't, I'm pretty sure I would not turn down that plea deal that he turned down. Yeah. The book is Beyond Innocence, Baby Zerwick. Tim Tyson, thank you both very much. Acapella Books has copies of Phoebe's book with uh, autographed book plate. And what you've heard tonight is just a, a sample of the, uh, the really heart-rending story.
that uh, that she tells. Thank you both, Phoebe, Tim. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Good night. Good night. Thank, Good night. thank you.